you to think about something that is like super important to you. Not just average of importance, right? Not just something that's common to you, but something that is valuable. Something that you love, something that you're passionate. Maybe it was a gift that somebody gave you. Maybe, um, maybe it's an ideal or a goal that you have. Maybe it's a special purpose that you feel like you have. Maybe it's something tangible, right? Maybe it's a, a gift or um, something that you made. It's important to you. Maybe it's someone. Maybe it's a family member, a child or spouse. Uh, maybe it's an animal or a pet. But it's got to be something that you value, that you really, really love. Okay, you got it? You got it in your mind? You kind of have it welling up some emotion in your heart? Okay, I've got two questions for you. What relationship is tied to that? What relationship is tied to that? And question two, how far would you go if you got separated from it? Just how far would you go if you got separated from that thing, that someone, that love, and that value that you have? Like really, how much effort are you willing to give if you were separated? Would you do everything you could, spend every last dollar that you had, 100% effort, all in, would you do it? Some of you are like, yeah, I'm in. I'm fighting to the death. We're doing this thing. And some of you are like, can I, can I change the thing I thought about? It's not, wor no, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Twenty, 24 years ago, I met this lady. But she didn't live close. It was like four hours away. I calculated 225 miles one way. But I tell you, every weekend just about, I was at Tim and Vicky's house. Just about every weekend. There were some weekends that she came to, came to our house in Houston, but I was in Kemp. I wanted to be there. I was all in. It was all effort that I could put out, and it was easy. It was easy to drive that after a long week on a Friday afternoon, it was easy to drive home because all I could think about was that lady. It was easy. But I put in so much effort. I felt like all that effort was there. And, and I know that she appreciated it because she kept wanting me to come back. And I think things worked out pretty well. But what if I put all that effort in and she rejected me? Would you put the same amount of effort in if you knew that you were going to be rejected? I don't, I don't know that I would. This morning, Adam wanted to start at the beginning, the beginning of us, but I want to go back even further. I want to go back to the beginning of our relationship with God. God has always, always desired a relationship with us with his creation, a relationship that he values, one that he's passionate about, one that he loves. But why is that? Because his creation, we're told in Genesis 2, verse 6, was made in his image. And Isaiah 43, 4 says that he, he thinks that we are precious to him. In the Old Testament, we read of how he went to all of these great lengths and so much effort to give us, give his creation the opportunity to know who he is and to have that kind of relationship with him. But we also see that despite his efforts, his creation oftentimes rejected him over and over and over again. And yet God still loved and pursued and desired that relationship with his creation. 
If we go back and start in the Garden of Eden, we can see that God made all of these wonderful and beautiful things. Not only to his glory, but for these two people that were there. For Adam and Eve, what an amazing place it must have been. I, we can only imagine just by reading in, in Genesis that, that it must have been an amazing place. Every tree that you could imagine that was good to eat, they had no worries. They had no worries for food. Everything they needed was provided for. What an amazing place it was, and, and, and maybe still is. We don't know that it was ever destroyed. It was just guarded by angels, right? What provision God made for his creation. The fact that Adam and Eve were able to be there with God. That he walked with them there and had conversation with them. You see, that's the kind of relationship that God wants with us. That Yahweh wants with us. One that's close and personal and intimate and spiritual. That he can take care of us, but if and only if we're willing to submit to him. You see, there was no separation between Adam and Eve and God. They were together. And there was harmony and they were happy and everything was good. But then, Genesis 3 says that sin came into the picture, didn't it? Satan had a conversation with Eve and then with Adam, and God's creation rejected him. Satan encouraged them to reject God and the requirements of of their relationship. He said, listen, you can be like God yourself. You don't have to submit to him. And so what did God do? There were consequences for their actions and God separated them from the Garden of Eden. No longer could he have that relationship with them. That rejection continued with Cain killing Abel because he wanted to do what he wanted to do and not what God asked him to do. In Genesis 6, we see that things began to get pretty bad. And it says that in verse Five of chapter 6 of Genesis, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They had rejected God. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. All the effort that he had put out to just try to have a relationship with him and they rejected him. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created in the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, and the birds of heaven, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Things have become so corrupt on the earth. This idea of corruption, I, I think sometimes we, we have lost the old definition of it, but it was one of a state of decay, of being rotten or putrid. Can you just imagine how the earth was? Maybe we're getting close. I sure hope not. But can you imagine the corruption that was there if it was just Noah? And so in choosing Noah, he said, listen, I'm going to separate you from everyone else. And because of his love and passion and value for his creation, he refined it. He took those that rejected him away and he chose Noah. And God said to Noah in Genesis chapter 6 verse 11, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. 
for the earth is filled with violence. But behold, I will destroy them with the earth. But he also says that through Noah, in verse 18, God says that he will establish his covenant with him. So now a new covenant is made. And we go a little bit further along, and what happens again? I hope some of you younger folks in here are remembering what's happening on your timeline, right? What happens next? Remember the Tower of Babel? Man, I think I've missed a lot of significance over the years about what actually happened here. Maybe you have too. God's creation was at the point where they just didn't need him anymore. Once again, they were rejecting him. Genesis chapter 11, we see that in verse 4, they wanted to make a name for themselves. It was no longer okay to be God's creation. No longer okay to be his children, to be those of his covenant with Noah. It was now we want to make our name for ourselves. And in that region of Mesopotamia, you see a great rejection of God. And they want to go and they want to build this tower so they can be closer to God and live in the heavens just as he is. They want to be like God. And so what does he do? It wasn't enough for his creation to rely on him, to do the things that he asked for them to do. They wanted to do it themselves. They wanted to be on their own. They didn't need God anymore. And so they said, listen, we, we just want to be by ourselves. We want to do our own thing. And God recognized that. God recognized that in a way where if we look in, in chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Come, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower, with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is, the only, this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. God recognized that they didn't need him anymore. They were self-sufficient, nor did they want to. And so, as parents, sometimes we recognize that trouble can be had when our children are together. So what do we do? We separate them. Y'all can't play nice together. Y'all got to separate. You're on the other side, Veronica. Right? As, as teachers, we have to do that to make sure that things are kept in the right way. And so this is where I think the real effort begins, because out of God's love for his creation, he changed their languages, didn't he? Hence the term, the Tower of Babel. Their, their languages were all different. And he dispersed them each to their own nation, to their own part of the world, because he cared for them. He cared for them in a way because he didn't want them to get in trouble. He didn't want to have another Genesis 6 situation where he had to destroy the earth. He'd already made a covenant not to do that again. And so this is really where God's effort begins. This is really where God's plan of salvation culminates into an even greater story. The story of redemption. And so... Through this area of Mesopotamia where this major rejection happened, God goes and he says, Abraham, I want you. I want to draw you out of this area of rejection, this land of rejection, where they don't need me, and I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to have a covenant with me. And in Genesis 12, he, he refines and purifies that creation again. And he gives three promises, doesn't he? Three promises that we know. The land, the seed, and the nation. All nations will be blessed. Wait a minute. He, he just separated himself from all these other nations. What is he talking about? We'll get there in a minute. And so we see God's hand in history as we look through the Old Testament. 
how he chose Abraham, and through his family we see Joseph going down into Egypt, and how through that covenant he saved his people, his covenant people, and how God revealed himself to Moses, and with such great effort to pull them from Egypt, he had these plagues that he, that he put through. Think about the effort that God went to to save his people. Can you imagine the effort that he went through to pull them out of the, the slavery and the bondage of Egypt, knowing that once they got out, that they would reject him? And yet over and over, we see this, this same pattern. God provides for them. He gives them guidance and protection while they're in the wilderness. And over and over again, they reject him. He gives them this law in this tabernacle so that he can have, once again, a relationship with his covenant people. And God tells his covenant people in Deuteronomy 4, you've got to do these things. You've got to obey my law because that is how other people and other nations are going to know what kind of relationship you have with me. It's how they will know that you are my people. It's the influence that you will have and it is the way that you and I can continue to have this covenant. And yet over and over, God's covenant people reject him despite his care. They doubt that, that they will help him. And so for 40 years, they have to wander in the wilderness. And yet for 40 years, he cares for them. You would think God would be tired by now. You would think his effort would be expended. You would think over and over again that God would be like, what are you doing? I'm putting all this effort out to show you my love and to show you that I, I want you to be in a relationship with me. And yet you keep rejecting me. And so for 40 years, God creates a separation between those that trust him and those that don't. And as they go into the promised land, God does some pretty amazing and supernatural things to show his covenant people that he cares for them and that he keeps his promises. And we read about stories like Jericho. Because they did what God told them to, they were victorious. And as we go through and we see how God begins to have judges for them, we go through that same pattern, that same cycle where they trust in him for a while and then all of a sudden they just reject him again. And then the great slap in the face. God, we don't want you as our king anymore. We want our own king. We want a human king to rule over us. But yet over and over again, God helps his people. He helps his people to be able to, to live life. He helps his people to continue to have that relationship with him. He continues to go to the extreme over and over and over again. He tells the Israelites in Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55 and verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. In the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he is abundantly pardoned. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. At this point, I would have been done. I would have walked away a long time ago. I'm sure you would have too. Over and over and over again, story after story, account after account, despite their rejection, God's ways and God's thoughts and his love and his compassion keep showing up. God never gives up on his relationship with his covenant people. Even when they were eventually taken captive once again and separated and scattered and refined. 
All the while, God's plan to bring his creation back to an Eden-like relationship begins to take place. You see, despite, once again, our rejection, the Son of God, Jesus, is born. God's effort to have a relationship with him continues through Jesus' life and Jesus' death. God wants to show us how much he loves us, so he sent his son to live a life, a life of compassion for others, a life of character in the way that God continued to show his character through all of the Old Testament. If we go to John chapter 1, John chapter 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, the life was the light of men. This Word was there from the beginning when creation happened. This Word was there when man first rejected God. And yet he subjected himself to come to earth. Continuing in verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and he was, the, he was um, made through, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. What? You mean they rejected him again? The Son of God came, and they rejected Him again? But to all who did receive Him, to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, to have a relationship with Him, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And that word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And so God's covenant people now see a different picture of God. Not one that is high in the heavens that rules. Not one that provides miraculously, but one that looks like them. One that they can touch and they can feel. One that shows compassion on them and one that heals them. One that provides teaching for them and truth and grace. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 11, we see that even some of the scholars and the teachers like Nicodemus struggle with this idea. They struggle with this idea of who Jesus was. John chapter 3, verse 11, it says, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus was saying, listen, you've got to be born again. You can't live this old life that you've been living of rejecting the Lord. You've got to be born again. And Jesus answered him and said, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. You reject it. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe it, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? How can Jesus describe to Nicodemus this relationship, this Eden-like relationship of intimacy and conversation He wouldn't understand it. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, 
but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. You've already been separated from God because he has not believed in the name of the only son. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They enjoyed being separated from God. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. But yet God says that his plan to save the world was only through Jesus. Talk about effort. That's not just effort, that's sacrifice. That's giving up everything. Were you there at the beginning? We talked about that thing that was so valuable for you. Were you like, yeah, I'm all in. I'll give everything for it. Jesus' love for you and I is even greater. To the point where he gave his only son, his only son for us. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. The Apostle Paul explains to us how these things work and how God's plan came into being. It says, for while we were still weak, while you and I were separated from God, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For those that rejected God, he died for them. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare to even die. But God shows his love. He demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still separated from him, while we were without a relationship with him, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from that wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Paul understood what God was trying to accomplish. He understood that God's desire was for you and I to have a relationship with him. For his covenant people to come back to him and have that relationship with him. For his creation to be drawn back to him. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, beginning in verse 1, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And is pleasing in the sight of our God who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. So Paul, you're saying that all of those people that he separated from himself, he, he wants them to be saved, but, but he separated himself from them. He, he had to. God in his righteousness had to do it because of his love for us and because of his love for his creation. But yet he desires that all people come to the knowledge of who he is and to his truth. And that truth is that he wants to have a relationship. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So when was that time? When was that proper time? This is where it really gets cool. In 
in Mark 16, it all comes full circle. Mark chapter 16, we see that Jesus gives the Great Commission. And in verse 14, it says, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he was risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world. Not just in Judea, not just in Jerusalem. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to only my, my people, only to the Jews, only to those who are willing to submit to me. He doesn't say that. Jesus says, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. But go and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. What, what gospel is this that he's wanting them to proclaim? What gospel is that? It is the gospel that Jesus came and died so that you and I can be reconciled to him. That the separation, the chasm that is between us and God can be bridged, can be closed. That we can have an intimate relationship with God again. We can have righteousness through Jesus. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that goes out to the whole of creation. As we move into the book of Acts and continue with this story of salvation, this wondrous story as we sing about, We see where Jesus is again speaking to the apostles. And it says in verse 6, So then they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Opportunity. Opportunity for his whole creation to respond to the gospel. As we look at the beginning of chapter 2, we see the day of Pentecost comes around. And as we look here in, in verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. How about you, but there's some effort involved in that. To make all of that happen, so that the credibility can be seen that they are speaking on God's behalf. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You see what happened there? Remember back, way back in Genesis, how God separated and divided His people? Those people that were working so closely together to create corruption and evil. And he changed all their languages so that they couldn't communicate. And they couldn't create even more evil and he separated them out. And now on the day of Pentecost, what does God do? He unites them again. He provides an opportunity where they can all hear the same gospel being preached. All in their own language. What an amazing thing. What an amazing opportunity for you and I to respond to that gospel that was preached. Such effort on the part of our Lord 
to pursue us that we might hear him. And so Peter begins to preach his sermon to them. It's interesting, though, all of the different, um, all of the different languages that were there. If you go back and look at, this is a study for another time, but it's so cool. If you go back and look at all the languages and all the places where they came from, all of these Jews that came to the day of Pentecost, it, it matches up with where they went after God changed their languages. So cool that God was able to do all of those things in his power, in his might, to show that he is the one working, that he wants to have that relationship with those people, that he wants to have a relationship with us. And so, so Peter begins to preach to those people, those people who had come in from afar off. And as they begin to, to listen, He talks about their separation, their separation from God and the lives that they've lived. And I'll tell you what, there had to have been something there that touched each one of them. Because in verse 36, he says, let all the house of Israel, everyone who was there, Therefore know that for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. One more time, you have rejected God. Over and over and over again, God has provided for you. And again, he brings his only son to you, full of mercy, full of compassion, full of love, and you crucified him. And verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said to them, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and to your children and to all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord God himself calls. To the ends of the earth. Are you separated from God? Have you rejected God? Have you wanted to make a name for yourself because you thought it was cooler than God's name? That opportunity is for you now. For you and I to submit ourselves to God and repent. And to take on that name of Christ. We can do as they did on the day of Pentecost. We can be reunited with him. That separation can no longer be there anymore. But we can have a relationship with God. A relationship only through Christ. Only through our Lord and Savior who provides that for us because of his righteousness. Maybe you did have a relationship with, with God. And maybe you have set that relationship aside. Will you please make that right? God wants you to make it right. Do that now as we stand and sing.